for financial abundance. Thank you for covenant riches. The Abrahamic Isaac Jacob order of blessings. Receive that today. I bless your business in Jesus' name. I bless the work of your hands in Jesus' name. Everything you touch is blessed in the name of Jesus. Quickly come up here so you don't, you don't topple into people. Brondo Reba, Iskatare, Undo Rebati, Iskani Aramondi Araba, Riki Diara, Rostonia Roma. Now, from now through the end of this year, this is a turning point in your ministry. Everything flows easy. The money flows easy. Attendance increase flows easy. Break it, California, in Jesus' mighty name. In the name of Jesus, I claim California for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the Araba, the devil's not going to have the West Coast or the East Coast or the Midwest or Texas or the border. America shall be saved. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you today. Glad to be on with you. I tell you, I never get tired of that video. Pastor Jonathan giving us that word. And that was um, that word. I got that word about maybe a little less, around two weeks or a little less than two weeks before uh, the Lord opened the door for us to start getting things moving to get into our building. So thank God for the word of the Lord. Thank God for prophecy. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. I want to welcome you to the broadcast this morning um, and apologize for lack of broadcast for almost two weeks now. Um, various reasons for missing several of those broadcasts, but we're continuing with our controversial series. And um, I wanted to approach, I think I talked about this a little bit the last time I did a broadcast, but I wanted to approach the controversial series um, from different aspects. And so who knows how long I'm going to be doing this series for. But I wanted to do uh, this series this on controversial subjects within the body of Christ for not just theological things, but I want to talk about sociological things. I want to talk about moral things. Um, and so we started off on the theological side of things because I, I feel most comfortable, to be honest with you, in that area uh, because of how much study I, I give to the Word and how much I love the Word of God and how important it is for me uh, as a pastor to be able to uh, relay to my church members the truth about what the Bible has to say on certain subjects. Uh, and then there's there's a passion on the inside of me to be able to convey clearly from the Word uh, on many of these subjects because so many of us are connected nowadays in the realm of social media and, and so forth. And so the availability to hear conflicting views um, is more prevalent than ever before. And not that everybody has to agree with what I have to say, but it's important to me that our church, um, first of all, hear what I have to say on subjects and hear a, a clear and uh, um, extensive explanation of, of what I believe on certain subjects. And then also, I want to empower our church members, number one, to know how to study the Bible for themselves. And then number two, to know how to answer all those who question the hope that is within you with meekness and fear, as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says. So I, I'm approaching this controversial series from the theological side first, uh, but we are going to get into so, some sociological things. We're going to get into um, you know, some hot-button issues uh, within our generation. Uh, I am going to do a broadcast on abortion. I am going to do a broadcast on um, you know, LGBTQIA plus, uh, you know, that, that entire realm, that entire subject. I'm going to be talking about all of those things. Uh, and in those, those particular subjects, along with other hot button issues that, that, that regard this generation and regard this time that we're living in, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about er areas that in those realms, the church has made mistakes and the church has, has, has messed up and hasn't approached things the way that they should. Um, because, you know, I don't believe in the body of Christ, I really don't believe there's enough transparency. One thing that I love about my pastor, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, is the amount of transparency that he offers, not just in a one-on-one -on -one approach, 
But from the pulpit, the man is extremely transparent. He'll tell you when he feels he's made a mistake. Um, you know, one of the most powerful messages I think I've ever heard Pastor Rodney preach was actually recently, I believe it was the Saturday morning service of the recent January camp meeting. Pastor Rodney preached from uh, the book of Numbers where Moses was instructed by God to speak to the rock for it to give forth water, but instead he struck it. Um, and that cost him the promised land. And Pastor Rodney talked about, you know, how um, he had missed it in a few areas, even in the construction of the new sanctuary. And uh, I loved his transparency. It really touched my heart and, and it really ministered to me and, and actually set me free uh, in a few areas uh, in my soul, in my mind. And so I'm very grateful for that. And I try to follow his example. I try to be extremely transparent and, and just tell people how things are, you know, because the Bible is very transparent. You know, David is one of the heroes of the Bible, but the scripture does not make him out to be some perfect person who never made any mistakes. You know, it, it, it would take both hands to count the number of mistakes that David made in the scripture, though the Lord loved him very much. Abraham, you know, the father of faith. Uh, and, and, and the one whose faith example we're supposed to follow. But the Bible tells us about his mistakes. It tells us that he went down to Egypt when he was supposed to stay in Canaan's land. It tells us that he slept with Hagar. You know, it, it tells us that he uh, had issues with Abimelech and that they were his fault. So, you know, very powerful. Um, transparency is a very powerful thing because if you can give people opportunity to learn from your mistakes... Um, then number one, they'll be able to avoid them. Uh, but number two, it will actually, I believe, a minister or somebody in a position of uh, repute, if they're transparent about what's going on, both positive and negative, if they're transparent about what's going on, I believe it actually elevates the authority of the scripture. Because, for example, as, a, as, you're, as many of you are, who are watching are, are, are church members, if not all of you, if I make a mistake, that doesn't change what the Bible has to say. Faith still works. The Bible still works. God's word is still true. If I make a mistake, that doesn't change this. And so my transparency about something that I should have done differently, I believe actually elevates the authority of God's word in your life. And that's what I want for you as, as your pastor, as a pastor, uh, is that your connection, your, your approach to success in this Christian walk is not through me, but it's through primarily your relationship with the Word of God. My, my job as a pastor is simply to illuminate in the Word things that you may not have seen before and to encourage your spirit by the Holy Ghost. That, that's, that's what I'm called to do. That, that summarizes my call as a, as a pastor. But I'm not called to be, you know, I'm not called to be your Jesus. You have a Jesus. He's seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenlies, and he ever lives to make intercession for you. Uh, I hope you understand what I mean by that. And so um, my transparency, I believe, would be a, should be a blessing to you in that way. So that this whole series, the controversial series, is meant to be uh, a transparent look at subjects that many Christians live with questions regarding. And, um, and, and we're going to deal with several of those things over the course of this series. I'm, I'm still approaching from the theological side of things right now as far as this controversial series goes. So uh, I've wasted enough time with my introduction here. Today, I'm going to be getting into the subject of predestination. Predestination. Because this is a hot button issue in the body of Christ right now. Uh, Calvinists figured out how the internet works. And so they've been promulgating and pushing their, their narrative and their, their doctrines uh, on social media. And it's, it's drawn a lot of attention. Excuse me. And it's also drawn a lot of... Um, um, it's also brought a lot of confusion to a lot of people. And so I want to talk about this subject of predestination with you today. Uh, and we're going to do so from several chapters of the Bible that are highly misused, um, that cause a lot of confusion with people. We're, we're going to clarify from the scripture today um, these chapters of the Bible that, that should bring you peace when, when it's all said and done here. So I want you to turn with me. Let me say good morning to everybody, by the way. Uh, we've got 
quite a few people watching. I'm grateful for that. Good morning, Patricia. Good to see you. Good morning, Miss Connie. Good to see you. Hannah, good morning. Ashley, good morning. Denise, good morning. My beautiful wife, my beautiful mother. Good morning, good morning. Evan, good morning, my friend. Praise the Lord. Delilah, good morning. If you're watching and you haven't commented, please say good morning so I can say it back. Praise the Lord. Don't know if we have any other men watching besides Evan, but if we got any other fellows watching, I'd love to uh, hear from you today. Serena, good morning. Good to see you. Gabby, good morning. Glad you're on today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would please, to Romans chapter 8. Uh, now, the, the, pride, the majority of this broadcast today is going to be in the following chapter, chapter 9, but I want to address something Paul said in chapter 8 before we go to chapter 9, mostly because, as many of you have heard me say before, you have to remember that the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. So, Every single word of the scripture is inspired by the Holy Ghost. But the um, categorization uh, of the chapters and the verses of the scripture, that was broken down by man uh, for simply for reference sake, so that it would make it easier to, to locate certain passages of scripture. That, that was it. And so when Paul wrote this, every word of, of this book of Romans here, Paul wrote, and he wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But when he wrote it, he didn't have, when he wrote it, when he, is that the right word? Yeah. When he wrote it, he didn't have um, the mindset of chapter and verse. He was writing a letter to Christians that he was wanting to convey certain theological truths to. And so... Um, anyway, so I want to, uh, address that with you today. So Romans chapter eight, and I'm going to begin to read from verse 28. Good morning, Sherry. Good to see you. Glad you're on. Love you. I'm going to begin to read from, from verse 28, Romans chapter eight and verse 28. And we're going to talk about what the common narrative surrounding the word predestination is and then what the Bible actually teaches. Amen. Because what religion likes to do is they like to attach a uh, connotation to certain words and certain phrases so that when you hear those words or phrases, you think of them um, from the perspective that the religious crowd wants you to see them from. Uh, but if you can, if you can eliminate, if you can shed those, those presuppositions and those ideas from your mind and simply approach the word with what it clearly and specifically says, you're going to come to a different conclusion than, than the conclusion that, that many religious, um, people with, with, with particular agendas want you to believe, um, I want you to say this out loud today. Say, I want to be biblically correct. And you can type that in the comments as well. Say, I want to be biblically correct. And here's what I mean by that. I grew up uh, charismatic Pentecostal, so to speak. I mean, we, we went to some pretty um, contemporary churches when I was growing up, but only because we didn't know of any Holy Ghost churches in our area. But, um, I, you know, my mom spoke in tongues. I was baptized in the Holy Ghost at a young age. I spoke in tongues. We always loved miracles and the move of God and everything. And so I grew up Pentecostal, charismatic, uh, word of faith. Um, but I don't want my doctrine to be Pentecostal, Pentecostally correct. I don't want my doctrine to be charismatically correct. I don't want my doctrine to be correct according to the word of faith. I want my doctrine to be biblically correct. Now, if I come to the same conclusions that those groups do, then so be it. But I'm willing, I'm willing to break from any other group or sect or division of Christians if I believe that the Bible says something contrary to what they, contrary to what they teach. Uh, uh, so I side with Pentecostal charismatic word of faith doctrine um, for the most part because of, of my honest reading of the scripture. But if I differ or break from them in any area or any other group of Christians, if I break from a Calvinist, if I break from an Arminian, if I break from a, a, a Baptist, if I break from a, uh, you know, 
Presbyterian or whatever because of what they teach and what their teaching is contrary to the word, so be it. And I'm willing, I'm willing to stand in any doctrine and in any area, I'm willing to stand alone if I believe from my honest priest, uh, my, my honest uh, approach to the word, free of any presuppositions, that I believe that the Bible teaches a certain thing. And so, uh, but I'm also willing to change in any area. Every time I approach the word, I'm willing to have my doctrine upended. I'm willing to have my theology upended. And you should have that same approach to the word every time you get into it. You should never get into the Bible to look to prove yourself right. You should only ever get into the word of God with the desire to understand God's truth, even if it contradicts what you believed was true prior to that. Can you say amen? So Romans chapter 8, verse 28, the apostle Paul says here, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 28, I'm going to read that again. We know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, excuse me, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Verse 29, for those whom he did foreknow, Foreknow means he knew them ahead of time. For those whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. There's predestination. What did he predestinate them for, though? Those whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed into the image of his son. That his son might be the firstborn among many brethren. So I want to eliminate a presupposition that surrounds the word predestination right now. Because when you hear the word predestination, the first thing you think is people that were predestined by God to either be saved or predestined by God to be damned. There is a, a doctrine called unconditional election, which teaches that God, before anybody was ever born, before any humans were ever created, God in his infinite um, um, capabilities, uh, everything, his, all, all of his uh, omni characteristics, um, that he chose before the foundations of the world who would be saved and who would be damned. And that the doctrine of unconditional election teaches that he did not choose who would be saved based off of his foreknowledge of what they would decide, but he chose who would be saved, who would be saved with no condition. In other words, he decided they were going to be saved, and he is going to make sure that that person gets saved. And at the same time, there are other people that he chose they were going to be damned. Uh, and he's going to make sure that they're damned, that they never come to faith, that they never believe the gospel. And so, uh, and that God works everything out to the counsel of his will is, is, is how they teach it. And so the doctrine of unconditional election, which is a false doctrine, has to be accompanied by another doctrine called irresistible grace. Irresistible grace, which is that if you were predestined or, or, or elected to be saved, then the grace that brings salvation, when that grace comes to you, you are unable to resist it. You can't resist it. And all of that is completely unbiblical. Uh, because, first of all, verse 29 here that we just read together, it says, those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he foreknew, he predestined. So the foreknowledge came first. So to teach unconditional election... That it's not a matter of God knowing ahead of time what you're going to choose because, because he's omniscient and because he's God, but to teach people that God decided he wanted to save you and there's nothing you could do about it and somebody else he wanted to damn them and there's nothing they could do about it. That is already, in just a handful of words, that's already directly contradicted by the Apostle Paul here in verse 29. Those whom he did foreknow, 
he also predestinated. But also, I want to point something out to you today, that the word predestination should not carry in your mind the presupposition that predestination is in regards to salvation. That God destined some people for some salvation and destined other people for damnation. Because that's not what this verse says. Look what this verse says. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to what? To be conformed into the image of his son. That is referring to the glorification of the believer. It's not referring to the justification of a sinner coming to faith in Jesus and being saved. It's referring to the glorification of the believer. Because remember, 1 John chapter 3 Verses 1 through 3 say, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and though we don't know what we shall be, we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, or we or conformed into his image, for we shall see him as he is. So verse 29 says, Those whom he did foreknow, he predestinated to be conformed into the image of his son, or in other words, to receive our glorification. Because that process of glorification, of us receiving our glorified body, of us being uh, in every way, spirit, soul, and body, in every way, looking like and resembling and, and, and mimicking the glory of Jesus Christ, that's the predestination. And glorification cannot be a, predestina- a, pre- a predestined um, end for an unbeliever. Glorification can only be a predestinated uh, result for a believer. So those whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Now, let's approach the word foreknow. In other words, to know beforehand. Okay, so if we're going to say he knew us beforehand, we have to determine what the before or when the beforehand is. Those whom he did foreknow. When is the foreknowledge? When did the foreknowledge start? Remember, we're talking about glorification here. No believer, not even the ones in heaven, no believer has been glorified yet. None of us will be glorified until we receive uh, our glorified bodies at the rapture of the church. That's when the glorification takes place. So the beforehand knowledge, the foreknowledge of God here is not referring to his um, uh, eternally past knowledge that applies before the foundation of the world. It's a foreknowledge, or in other words, a knowledge that came beforehand in regards to before the glorification, which none of us have been glorified yet. So in other words, Paul is saying that God already knows beforehand now that he wants us or that he's determined for us as believers to be conformed into the image of his son. The foreknowledge is not referring to before the foundations of the world, which we'll get into that verse in Ephesians 1 in just a minute. The foreknowledge is referring to knowledge before the glorification knowledge before the glorification. You have to shed the connotation that foreknowledge always means before the foundation of the world and predestination always means predestined to be saved or to be damned. You have to shed those connotations and you have to read the verse for what it says. Because again, when it says he also did predestinate them to be conformed to the image of his son, that's not referring to the justification that a sinner receives at the moment that they're saved when they believe the gospel. The being uh, conformed into the image of his son is referring to the glorification that will take place at the rapture of the church. Can you say amen? So those whom he did foreknow, he, he foreknows all of us, all of us as believers, he foreknows now that we will be glorified one day when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is, as 1 John chapter 3 says, okay? Those whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son. Why? So that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. The only one who has been glorified up to this point is Jesus. He's also the only one that's received the bodily resurrection. Now, we remember that the rapture of the church 
is the continuation of the first resurrection. Because remember, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that those who are uh, um, the dead in Christ shall rise. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And ever shall we be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So Jesus was the first one to receive the bodily resurrection. And he's the first one to receive the bodily glorification. So he's the firstborn among many brethren right now. When the rapture of the church takes place and the believers who have died bodily and their uh, souls and spirits are in heaven right now, at the rapture, their souls and spirits come with Jesus. Their physical bodies get brought up out of the ground. Their bodies and their souls and spirits meet together again, and then they receive their glorified body. That is the continuation of the first resurrection. And then they are made like, or they are then conformed into the image of Christ. Because Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren who received not only the bodily resurrection, but received also the bodily glorification, which is what we are all uh, uh, anticipating and waiting for. Amen. So then he goes on here in verse 30. Moreover, those whom he did predestinate. Now, if you don't shed the connotation, the presupposition if you don't shed the connotation or the presupposition that predestinate means predestined to be saved or predestined to go to heaven, then verse 30 is not going to make sense to you. But we already read from verse 29 what the predestination is. The predestination is for the believer to receive their glorification. So it's not talking about initial salvation, which we call justification from the scripture. So verse 30, moreover, who, those whom he did predestinate, what did he, who did he, what did he predestinate for them? For them to be glorified, to the, for them to receive the bodily glorification, to be conformed into the image of his son. Verse 30, moreover, those whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. So we're working backwards now. In verse 30, we're working, we're working backwards. Whom, moreover, whom he did predestinate. Remember, we're talking about the predestination of glorification. Those are the ones that he called. That's referring to sanctification. That once you've been justified, the Spirit of the Lord calls you into the place. He's constantly drawing you into the place of sanctification. To, to shed your, your worldly thinking, to shed your worldly living, to shed uh, unbiblical, ungodly, uh, anti-kingdom ways of doing things and, and to begin to, to separate yourself and, and, and to uh, consecrate yourself to the purposes of God. We're working backwards here in, in verse 30. The predestination is referring to glorification. The calling is refer referring to sanctification. And those whom he called are the ones that he also justified. Okay? And then he says, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, somebody says, well, that's past tense there. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So, pastor, you're saying that glorification comes later, but that verse there looks like it's saying that glorification has already happened. Remember... Because God has predestined you to that moment, he already sees that moment as completed. He already looks at you as if you've been glorified. He already deals with you as if you've been perfected. Because in, in the mind of God, because you've been predestined for that moment, he considers it done. Amen. It would be like if I have somebody who's trustworthy. Uh, I'll, I'll use an example of somebody that we know. Mark Owen, who, who, who is such a blessing to us at our church, just a phenomenal man of God. If I ask him to do anything, literally anything I've asked him to do, uh, uh, I mean, it just gets done. So because I can trust him that much, because I'm so assured of his faithfulness, when I ask Mark to do anything, I consider it done now. Even though the task itself hasn't yet been completed, because of his uh, faithfulness and because I'm assured of how faithful he is and, uh, and, and how much of a man of his word he is, when I ask him to do something, I just consider it done. There's many times I don't even look to see if it got done. I just figured it got done because, because Mark is that kind of man. Well, God is not necessarily assured of anybody else's word here, but he is assured of his own word. 
And he is assured of the work of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. God, uh, the Father, is fully, uh, he has fully entrusted us to the Holy Spirit and is fully assured that the Holy Spirit will, will complete his work. And so those whom he justified, God already considers them glorified. Now that's good news to hear as a believer. But I wanted to address that in verses 29 and 30 to show you that the predestination has nothing to do with whether you're going to be, whether you're going to go to heaven or whether you're going to go to hell. The predestination has to do with your, your future state of glorification when you receive your, your glorified body. And if Jesus tarries and any of us die bodily, we receive the bodily resurrection at the rapture of the church. Can you say amen? So, I want you to write this in the comments today. Predestination does not refer to salvation. Predestination does not refer to salvation. Predestination does not refer to salvation. You guys are doing so good keeping up with me in the comments here today. I hope you're getting something out of this. Okay, so with that being said, uh, I want you to go with me, skip to the next chapter, and here's where we're going to spend most of our time today, uh, is in Romans chapter 9. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read maybe the whole chapter here, but I'm going to read a large chunk of Romans chapter 9 to you here. And then I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the connotation and the presupposition that certain religious folk want you to read Romans 9 in. And then I'm going to clarify what Romans 9 actually says. Okay, I'm going to clarify what Romans 9 actually says. Amen. So Romans chapter 9, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. There we go, everybody put in the comments. Predestination does not refer to salvation. That's absolutely correct. Predestination in these two verses refers to the glorification of the believer. The glorification of the believer. All right, Romans chapter 9, and I'm going to begin to read from verse 1. So the Apostle Paul here says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience, which is his, his, the voice of his spirit, his personal spirit, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit and his spirit are both in agreement that what he's about to say is the truth. Verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Give me one second here. I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. Who are your brethren, Paul? My kinsmen according to the flesh. Well, who are, who are Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh? Who are Paul's kinsmen in the natural? In the spiritual, Paul's kinsmen would be fellow believers, would be Christians. Whatever their nationality or race or background is, spiritually, Paul's, uh, Paul's brethren would be believers. But who would be his brethren or his kinsmen according to the flesh? Can somebody answer that in the comments for me? Who would be the Apostle Paul's kinsmen or brethren according to the flesh? The Jews, that's right, my beautiful mother. The Jews, that's right, the Hebrew people, the children of Israel. Amen. Now, he makes that very clear in verse 4. He says, who are Israelites? <laughs> he said, I mean, he just, he just makes it as clear as day there in verse 4. Listen to this. Who are Israelites? To whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the services of God, referring to services, uh, the, the priestly service at the temples uh, and the tabernacles, and the promises. Yes, Gabby, the Jews, correct. Verse 5, to whom belong the fathers, referring to the fathers uh, or the patriarchs of the Jewish people, which would be Abraham and Moses and so on. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12, the 12 um, sons who became the 12 tribes, and so on and so forth. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, 
Christ came because Jesus was a Jew. I know people don't like to hear that for whatever reason because people are weird. But yes, Jesus was a Jew. He came from the line of Judah. He was, he was a direct physical uh, flesh. According to the flesh, he was a direct physical descendant of David. Anyway, uh, as concerning the flesh, Christ came who is over all. God, blessed, uh, God be blessed forevermore. Amen. Verse 6. Not as though, listen to this, not as though the word of God has taken none effect. Listen to this. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But the scripture says, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. That's what God spoke to Abraham. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children, and then in parentheses, verse 11 says, so this is parenthetical, Verse 11 says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. Verse 12, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. Who were Isaac's children? Esau and Jacob. Esau and Jacob. Okay? As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. Verse 17, for the scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, he will have mercy on whom he wills. Listen to this. And whom he wills, he hardens. You will say unto me, well, then why should God find any fault? Because who can resist his will? No, but O oh man, who are you that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me this way? Doesn't the potter have power over the clay? Of one lump to make a vessel for honor, and of another lump to make a vessel of dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the rich of, riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory? Even us, whom he has called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and I will call her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And Isaiah said beforehand, Except the Lord of Seboeth had left us a seed, we would have been like Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained righteousness because of faith? But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Okay. When you understand Romans chapter 9, it becomes such a powerful chapter. But if you allow a presuppositional approach to Romans chapter 9 into your mind when you read this chapter, it will become very concerning to you. 
And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to remove that concern. I knew I was going to have to read the whole chapter for me to get into uh, everything that I was saying. Okay. Verses 1 through 4 give us the context of this chapter. Context is everything. Context is everything. So you cannot lose, as you're reading this chapter, you cannot lose the context in your uh, perspective. You have to keep the context. What's the context of verses 1 through 4? The context of verses 1 through 4 is that the Apostle Paul is writing about the fact that his brethren, his kinsmen, according to the flesh, have not received Christ as their Messiah, and that it breaks Paul's heart so much that he would even be willing to be separated from Christ or to be accursed from Christ if somehow that meant his brethren, the Jews, the children of Israel, would receive Christ. Of course, it doesn't work that way. But in verses 5 and 6, the Apostle Paul goes into the fact that uh, the Jews or that the children of Israel, that it was God's plan that even though they had the patriarchs, even though they had the covenants, even though they had the services at the temple, even though they had the promises, even though they had all the miracles, it was God's plan for Israel to, as we just read at the end of the chapter, stumble at the stumbling block in order to open the way for the Gentiles to come to salvation. Because look at the two examples that Paul gives of the Old Testament. He gives two examples. He gives Ishmael and Isaac, and he gives Esau and Jacob. Now, if I were to ask you what Ishmael and Isaac and what Esau and Jacob have in common, hopefully you would come to the right conclusion. Here's the conclusion. Ishmael and Esau were both born first, but Isaac and Jacob are the ones who received the blessing. I'm going to say that again. Ishmael and Esau were born first, but the second born, Isaac and the second born, Jacob, were the ones who received the blessing. They were the ones who walked in the promise. They were the ones who furthered the covenants of God. And the Apostle Paul is laying out for us in context, in Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is laying out for us that Ishmael and Isaac and Esau and Jacob are a representation or a metaphor. Uh, one of the theological terms we like to use is a type and a shadow of what was to eventually become the children of Israel and the body of Christ. What do I mean by that? The children of Israel were born first in covenant with God, in that the children of Israel uh, were the ones who, who had the covenants of God. The children of Israel were the ones who had the patriarchs. The children of Israel were the ones who had the miracles. The children of Israel were the ones who had the services. The children of Israel were the ones who had the promises. They came first... But just like Ishmael, who cut himself off from the blessing because of his harassment of Isaac and had to be put away from Abraham, and just like Esau, who sold his birthright to Jacob, and the Bible says he sought repentance with many tears but could not find it, in the same way, Israel, though they were born first, they stumbled at the stumbling block so that salvation could be made available to the Gentiles. That's the entire context of Romans chapter 9. So what, what, what certain people try to teach about predestination and what certain people try to teach about uh, uh, election to salvation is that Romans chapter 9, they try to teach, is referring to individual election. This individual will be saved, but this individual will be damned. But Romans 9 is not talking about individuals. Romans chapter 9 is talking about groups. It's talking about the nation of Israel. And it's talking about the nation of the church. Because 1 Peter chapter uh, 2 calls us a nation. Your chosen generation, a holy nation. 
uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 calls us. So, because in the eyes of God, the, the, children of, uh, the children of God or the body of Christ is a nation in the eyes of God. So Romans chapter 9 is not referring to individuals. Romans chapter 9 is referring to groups. The vessels of honor is referring to the, to the Gentiles who would welcome salvation, who would receive Christ as the Messiah. Because how many of you have noticed that the church primarily is Gentiles? There are some Jews who, got, who have been saved, but primarily the church is Gentiles, right? Even though all of us understand that the children of Israel uh, were the focus of the Old Testament, yet the church is primarily Gentiles. So the vessels of honor is the church, the vessels of dishonor is the children of Israel. So somebody says, okay, so then what does that mean? Does that mean that God doesn't care about Israel anymore? That's not the case at all. Go with me to the very next chapter, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip down just a little bit. In Romans chapter 10, um, which by the way, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are all the same context. So remember, the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. So just because we start a new chapter does not necessarily mean we start a new context. We don't. Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11, all three of those chapters are all the same context. Okay? All right. So Romans chapter 10, look at what the Bible says here in verse 12. Verse 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, or in other words, the Jew and the Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich toward all who call upon him. Why would the Apostle Paul have to make that clarification in verse 12? That there is no difference with God between Jew or Gentile, the same God over all is rich toward all who call upon him. Why would he have to make that clarification in verse 12? Because in chapter, what we call chapter 9, he called the children of Israel vessels of destruction or vessels of wrath. So what he was doing is he didn't want his audience to think that he was saying that Jews can't be saved. So he clarifies in chapter 10, no, 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 no. Whosoever call upon, calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have a heart that believes unto, unto righteousness and a mouth that makes confession unto salvation, you're saved because for God, there's no difference between Jew or Greek for the same God over all is rich toward all who call upon him. So Paul was having to clarify he didn't want his audience who was reading his letter here to go so far into the ditch on the other side that they say that the Jews or the children of Israel can't be saved. So he clarifies here. He says, nope, same God over all is rich toward all who call upon him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, Jew, Gentile, you know, doesn't make any difference. Greeks, you know. Uh, Syrian, Mexican, Chinese, it makes no difference to God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's what chapter 10 is, is a clarification that whether you're Jew or Gentile, if you operate by faith, God receives you. Okay, then go with me to chapter 11, because then he clarifies in chapter 11 that God actually still has plans for the entire nation of Israel. Now, we're going to read uh, a few. We're going to jump around a little bit in chapter 11 here, because I want to I want to remind you that in chapter nine. In chapter 9, where's that verse, Lord? There it is. In chapter 9, verse 18, Paul said, Therefore, God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he decides to harden, he will harden. He says that in verse 18. And again, people try to use that verse to say, See, this individual, God had mercy on them and so, so that they could be saved, but this individual over here, he hardened so they could go to hell. No. Again, Chapter 9, 10, and 11 are all the same context. So yes, verse 18 does say he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he wills he hardens. But look what chapter 11 says. Chapter 11, verse 32. Chapter 11, Romans chapter 11, verse 32 says, Therefore God has confined 
or has categorized all of them to unbelief. Why? That he might have mercy upon all. So yes, chapter 9 verse 18 says he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. But chapter 11 verse 32 says he will have mercy on all. Amen. Yes, chapter 9, verse 18 says, He will have mercy upon whom he decides to have mercy. But verse 32 of chapter 11 says, He's confined them all to unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. So the Apostle Paul, you, you can't take Romans chapter 9 and just you, you elevate it above all other scripture and make, you know, make some sort of universal doctrine out of it, which many people have done. You can't do that. You have to take the whole scripture in context. Okay, so now let's go back to Romans chapter 11 and verse 1. I hope you're getting something out of this today. Romans chapter 11 and verse 1. Listen to this. I say then, I'm going to read a good chunk of scripture here. I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. Now who is his people that Paul's talking about here? He tells us, For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul is still calling physical national Israel God's people. And Paul says that the fact that he was a Jew or that he was a, ch uh, a Hebrew or a child of Israel... The fact that he got saved is proof that God has not cast away the nation of Israel. Verse 2, listen to this. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. There's that word again, foreknew. For does not the scripture say of Elijah, how he makes intercession to God against Israel? <laughs> <coughs> Did you know you can make intercession against somebody? How he makes intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, verse 3, they have killed your prophets, have torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life also. Verse 4, but what says the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, what's that remnant talking about? Is that remnant talking about a special group of Christians who do it right and all the other Christians are wrong? No. That's how a lot of people like to use the word remnant, but that's not what the Bible's saying here, and that's an unbiblical approach to the word remnant. What does it mean here when it says, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace? Remember, we have to keep the context. Verse 1, Paul says, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. The remnant that verse 5 is referring to is the small handful of Jews that have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Verse 5, the remnant, according to the election of grace, is the small handful of Jews that have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. Okay, so then in verse 6 he says, And if it's by grace, then it is no more of works, referring to the works of the law of Moses. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Verse 7, what then? Israel has not obtained that which it seeks for, but the election has obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Verse 7, who do you think the election is here in verse 7? Who do you think those, uh, the, the elect, who do you think the elect is here in verse 7? Do you think that Paul is all of a sudden abandoning his context and the elect in verse 7 is referring to those who were chosen to be Christians? 
Or do you think the elect in verse 7 is referring to the remnant of Jews that he was talking about in verse 5 that God would, would bring to salvation by their recognition of Jesus as the Messiah? So when you hear people say a term, the elect, the elect, there are a couple of places in the Bible that calls all Christians the elect. But the vast majority of the, t the time that the word elect is used, it is not referring to the entire body of Christ. It's referring to something else. and It's referring to a specific group, and you can only know what group it's talking about in context. You have to read the context of the passage. I'll give you an example. Second uh, John... Second John is, is actually, I'm sorry, is it Second John or Third John? Give me a second here. Second John. I was right. Second John, verse 1 says, to the elect lady. When it says to the elect lady, it is not referring to a lady who's elect to be saved or a lady who's chosen to be a Christian. That doesn't make any sense. Why would, why would the Apostle John, who everything else he wrote was to the whole church, now he writes a letter to one lady? No. He's re he says to the elect lady, her election is referring to the fact that she was the pastor of the church that John was writing to. She was elected by John, the apostle who started that church, she was elected by John to be the pastor. It's not referring to election as far as salvation in 2 John uh, chapter 1, verse 1. So you have to understand the context in order to determine who the elect is in a passage. So verse 7, but the elect has obtained it and the rest were blinded. It is not referring to... Uh, you know, those who were chosen for salvation have received uh, grace and then the rest of the whole world was blinded. The context is Israel. The context is national Israel. So the elect in verse 7 is referring to those Jews who would receive salvation by their recognition of Jesus as the Messiah. Can you say amen? So, do me a favor in the comments today. Let me know if this has clarified predestination for you. Because again, I want to reiterate what I'm saying here. The number one, Romans chapter 8, which is a popular verse used to teach people that God has predestined who would be saved and who would be damned. But we found out from Romans chapter 8 that the predestination is referring to believers receiving their glorification. Then we read in Romans chapter 9, where people try to use the verse about vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor, vessels of wrath and destruction and vessels of glory. We read from Romans chapter 9, people try to tell us that that's referring to individuals. Some individuals are vessels of wrath and some individuals are vessels of, of glory. But we read from Romans chapter 9 that Paul is referring to groups He's referring to this, the distinction between Israel and the body of Christ. That Israel was represented by Ishmael and Esau, and the body of Christ is represented by Isaac and Jacob. Can you say amen? And then we read in Romans chapter 10 that God clarifies that he is not withholding salvation from anybody. Because the same, uh, it makes no difference to him between Jew or Greek. For the same God over all is rich toward all who call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then we read in Romans chapter 11 that Paul says God has not cast away his people. Because Paul himself is proof that Jews can be saved. Because he also is an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And then Paul clarifies to us that there is a remnant according to the election of grace. But that that remnant is referring to Jews who for the most part have rejected Jesus. 
But again, God is not withholding salvation from them. If any of them will recognize Jesus as the Messiah, they also will be saved. So when you understand that, that should completely shed or eliminate the mindset that God has uh, chosen certain individuals. Because again, we, we've seen now that God is, Paul is, by the Holy Ghost, is not talking about individuals. He's talking about groups. He's talking about groups. There is nowhere in the Bible that teaches that God has determined one individual to be saved and another individual to be damned. Now, I do want to say this as well. Um, you know, somebody says, well, pastor, we just read in Romans chapter 9 that God spoke to Rebekah and said, Esau I have loved, but or I'm sorry, uh, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I, I have hated. Somebody says, so it says, you know, it shows right there, pastor, that God hates some people and loves others. No, that is a comparative statement. Because first of all, if you go to the book of Genesis and you read about Esau, even though he sold his birthright to Jacob, Esau didn't end up doing half bad himself. He was still a very blessed man. He became very wealthy. He was, he was very blessed because of his covenant, uh, because he was a child of Abraham, or he was a, a seed of Abraham. And then number two, you find out that Esau and Jacob don't have this divided relationship for the rest of their lives. When Jacob goes to see Esau as a grown man, Esau embraces him. He kisses him, he welcomes him into his home, and he blesses him. Amen. So what, what does that phrase mean, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated? It is a comparative statement. Remember Jesus said, unless you hate father, mother, sister, brother, wives, children for my sake and the sake of the gospel, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Did Jesus really mean that he wants you to hate, despise your family? No, it's a comparative statement. In other words, in comparison to your love for God's kingdom, your love for God's purposes, your love for God himself, it would look like to somebody else that you hate your own family because your devotion to God and your devotion to his kingdom is so immense and so great. So Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated is also a comparative statement because God was saying my purposes, my destination, my design, my plan for Jacob is so blessed that it would look like Esau is hated or Esau is left out. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to prove in, in chapters 9, 10, and 11. That it would look like because so few Jews or so few Israelites are saved, it would look like God hates them. But he doesn't because the Apostle Paul clarifies, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also... I'm an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. And he says in chapter 10, there is no difference between Jew or Greek for the same God over all is rich toward all who call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So there is no passage of scripture in the Bible that teaches that some individuals are elect to be saved and other individuals are elect to be damned. That is nonsense. It's not taught anywhere in the Bible. And I hope you came to that understanding in the scripture today. Did you get something out of that? If you got something out of that today, comment, let me know. If you're leaving this broadcast more confused than you were before, comment and let me know. Uh, I want to I wanna know if my teaching is effective or not. So let me know today. And uh, we're also going to give you an opportunity to give. Praise the Lord. Be generous today. You're watching this broadcast. If you don't normally give, give today. Ask the Lord what he would have you to give. You, you can use any one of these platforms. Cash app, dollar sign, truth, the letter N, triumph. Venmo, at symbol, truth, the letter N, triumph. Zelle, 951 951-536-1803. You can also give by text, 628-444-4136, or you can give by PayPal, paypal.me slash truth, the letter N, triumph. You can give by any one of these platforms today. We'll say thank you in advance. Praise the Lord. Got a lot of big things going on at the church. 
Some of you, when you get to church on Sunday, you're not going to recognize the, the, the lobby. We've done some, some major changes to the lobby, and I'm very excited about it. And uh, it's not finished yet. I don't know if it'll fin be finished by Sunday, but I think construction is a good thing because construction means progress. Amen. So, Miss Patricia says she's got it. How's everybody else doing? How's everybody else doing? Uh, Miss Patricia, the church, it's, it's of the church's volition. They can take communion whenever they want. Pastor Rodney takes communion with the River Church in Tampa every Sunday. Um, I do it when it's on my heart to do it, when I feel led to do it. A lot of churches do it at particular times. I know churches that do it once a month. I know churches that only do it on particular uh, events like Good Friday or Easter or, or Christmas or whatever. Um, the church is, it, you're free as a believer. You're free to take communion whenever you want. You can take it individually if you wanted. <coughs> Excuse me. You can take communion individually if you want. Um, at home by yourself. And get a cracker and some grape juice and take communion by yourself if you'd like. So the believer is free to take communion whenever they would like. Um, I think there's some times that are uh, extra appropriate to take communion. Easter, Good Friday, those are both good times to take communion. Um, but again, it's not required. The Bible doesn't give a specific time uh, when a believer is required to take communion. So really every ordinance or practice of the church is like that. The Bible doesn't give a specific point in time when people have to be baptized in water. The Bible doesn't give a specific point in time when people have to tithe. The tithe is just 10% of your increase. So whenever you're increased, you tithe. And you make sure that your tithe is your first 10%. Um, so all Christian practices, all Christian doctrines operate through liberty, not confinement. Uh, we took communion just a couple weeks ago, Miss Patricia. Troy, do you mean is a Messianic Jew part of the elect? Because you said elite. There are no elite in the body of Christ. So just clarify that for me. Is that what you mean? Is a Messianic Jew part of the elect? Yes, I meant elect. Okay, then yes, a Messianic Jew is part of the elect, uh, according to Romans chapter 11, verse 5. Um, Therefore, then there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So yes, Messianic Jews are part of the elect in that context. Praise the Lord. If you haven't given, give today. Give generously. Ask the Lord what He would have you to give. Just be obedient. Watch the Lord bless you. Praise God. All right. I've only gotten uh, two responses as far as people feeling like they learned something today. I hope nobody else's silence means that they didn't learn or that they were more confused. But uh, let me pray for you before you go today. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every person watching this broadcast. Thank you, Father, for those who will watch the recording later, that each person will come, Father, to a deeper and a greater understanding of your word in regards to what you have made available to every person, the great promises that we are permitted to walk in because of the shed blood of Jesus that cries even now from the heavenly mercy seat for us. We thank you, Lord, for it in Jesus' name. I bless every person watching, and I pray, Father, that this, the remaining days of this week would be the greatest they've ever had until they rejoice together in your house on Sunday morning. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. I want to remind everybody that tonight at our new location, 7 p.m., we have our Wednesday night service. Do everything you can to make it to service tonight. I'm continuing my series on faith. It's been a great, great uh, series so far. We've done two Wednesdays on it. They've been powerful. Tonight's going to be phenomenal as well. You don't want to miss it. So tonight at 7 p.m. at 721 Nevada Street, Suite 408, Redlands, California, 92373. We will see you there tonight at 7 p.m. Other than that, I love you. Te amo. Besitos. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.